What's up guys, Jay's Two Cents here, and you might have noticed we did not go to CES this year. That's because I ended up taking a vacation, and in fact, the whole company took a vacation, and we feel rejuvenated and recharged, and doesn't mean I'm gonna be any better at saying words. But regardless, we're gonna talk about some of the stuff we learned at CES. Specifically in this video, we're gonna talk about Intel's much anticipated, much awaited discrete graphics card, and whether or not it's gonna bring any competition whatsoever to AMD and Nvidia, and whether or not as a gamer, you should really even care. Featuring the Intel 9750H six core processor, up to 64 gigabytes of memory and multiple GPU options, the MAG15 laptop from Electronix is one of the lightest production and gaming notebooks on the market. Due to its magnesium lightweight chassis and 15.6 inch 144 hertz IPS monitor, the MAG15 weighs in at just four pounds, while the 94 watt hour battery provides hours of use on a single charge. To see the full spec list of the MAG15 from Electronix and to see their complete lineup of laptops and notebooks, click the sponsor link in the description below. So Intel's new graphics card is known as the XEDG1. Big X, little E, DG1. I wonder if EVGA's mad, because they have a DG series. Basically, on the surface, the XEDG1 is nothing more than an iGPU that you would find on like a 9900K or any desktop processor, a mainstream processor from Intel that has a graphics chip in it, stripped out, put onto its own board that now interfaces with the CPU and the motherboard through PCIe and doesn't even have a power connector and calling it discrete. In terms of performance, they are boasting a 100% improvement in performance over the current iGPU offerings from Intel. Now, I don't know what exactly that's gonna mean for gamers, because the problem is, CES is one of those shows that traditionally is not really known for giving you performance metrics. It's not really known for giving you all the details. It's a hype show. It's one of the reasons why we didn't even go this year, is that just after going for eight years, I wanted another year off. We took one year off several years back and I just did not wanna go this year. So I decided to kind of experience the show from a viewer perspective. And that's kind of given me the confidence to say that CES truly is nothing but a hype factory. It's nothing but getting some of the very basic information out there of something that's coming later this year, maybe even two years from now, because you gotta show something. AMD really disrupted Intel when it came to CPUs and getting back some of that market share. In fact, we did a video talking about that. Um, you guys can hopefully find a link down below. I'll probably forget to put it there, but whatever, I digress. We talked about the disruption that AMD caused to Intel, which put Intel on its heels in having something to respond with specifically for high performance desktop and mainstream desktops, which is why 10th gen, which is not even fully rolled out yet, is now being, it's already being obsoleted by the discussions of 11th gen, which took place at CES. So Intel clearly is moving faster than I think it can even bring products to market, but that's besides the point. Intel has had a mission now for nearly a decade to stick it to NVIDIA. There was kind of a business transaction that was attempted and didn't work out back in like 2011, and Intel really sort of has had its crosshairs from NVIDIA. The problem is NVIDIA is a huge beast when it comes to money, manufacturing, backing, and technology um, that, they've, that they've designed and, and implemented and pioneered on their own. Intel has kind of just sort of stuck to what it's known for a long time. In fact, it doesn't know GPUs. Uh, Intel hasn't even had a discrete GPU for nearly 20 years, which is why they went on a very interesting headhunting mission and poached Raja Kadori from AMD and Tom A. Peterson from NVIDIA. Now, Tom is actually an engineer and he is a, he is a microarchitecture engineer knows everything there is to know about GPUs, obviously. It's why he was very high ranking at NVIDIA. So it already, it already makes the whole discussion regarding non-compete and working with another company like that very interesting. But however, that's politics. We're not gonna get into that. In fact, Tom's pet project and things that he's always been interested in was SLI. But now with Tom being gone is why SLI is pretty much dead with NVIDIA, which means that you know now he's gonna be bringing in all of his knowledge to Intel. So that's a very, high-end, high-ranking piece of your chess set um, now sitting at Intel. Now on the flip side, Raja Kadori was known for the failure of the HBM stuff that took place all the way up to Radeon 7, leading to his sabbatical and then departure from AMD, now working at Intel. So I feel like you have one extremely successful, I'm not saying Raja's not successful, but really successful person within NVIDIA and one that left a poor legacy with AMD now both in Intel. So I'm really curious as to how that one's gonna play out, but the talent is clearly there. But Jay, if the iGPU sucks so bad, why is Intel basing a discrete graphics card off of the same architecture, even at 100% improvement? Because 100% improvement over mediocre is probably still mediocre. Depends on how far mediocre it is. iGPUs on Intel are literally as 
bad as it gets, in my opinion. Well, I believe I have two theories as to why, and this is the fun part of my video where I theorize and, and, and where I believe companies are going with this. I rarely do these videos, and when I do, I'm usually pretty accurate. So I feel confident in some of my reasoning behind why Intel's doing this. One, servers, workstations. Um, work, I'm not talking about like you've got a small business with 15 computers. I'm talking about your, your Phil, what's a big company? Microsoft. Yeah. <laughs> you're Microsoft with 50,000 workstations out there floating around doing programming that don't have crazy graph graphical, graphatical, gra GPU needs. And so even if you went out and spent 50 bucks on the cheapest AMD or, Int uh, I almost said Intel, or NVIDIA offering like the GT710, it's a waste of money because you don't need any of the high frame buffer uh, amount of RAM that's on there. You don't need the fast RAM because iGPU access to system memory, which is much lower than VRAM. And it's one of those things where it's just a waste of money. But if you're Intel, you're looking at that going, okay, our Xeons, our server grade stuff, our X platform, which a lot of companies have built workstations out of X299, uh, X99 CPUs, because they're a really cheap way to get Xeon level performance if you don't need ECC memory support, that's a whole different video. But what it means is that if you're running those CPUs, there is no iGPU from Intel on there. So all that money is being spent on another graphics card company like AMD or Nvidia. Well, I feel like Intel wants to keep that money in-house. They want to offer a single point of support because manufacturer support, when you have that many systems deployed is huge. It keeps a single point of contact for support for the very market dominating presence that Intel is when it comes to workstations and servers to be able to have a single brand across the entire build. So that's one theory there. It gives them a competition. It gives them competition uh, with AMD and NVIDIA when it comes to that particular use case. We're not talking about graphics. We're not talking about video editing. We're not talking about CAD. We're talking about word processing. We're talking about SQL servers. We're talking about you know, programmers that are that are doing, you know, C sharp or whatever and don't need a high-end GPU to handle all that. They need big CPUs with big amounts of memory. My other theory is that this card is not even close to what we may potentially see in the market. It's probably nothing more than the very basic architecture that future DG series graphics cards are gonna be based upon to give you day one support when they're ready to finally deploy a retail solution. This is nothing more than a super basic way to allow developers to understand the architecture so that they can kind of code for it. So it offers OS companies like Microsoft or game developers even, because obviously you're gonna need to make a gaming card, uh, an option to start being able to prepare for these launches when they come out, rather than just being surprised like everyone else or giving very little lead time to have support. Because you're now gonna have three different very drastically different architectures in terms of hardware that now will need to be supported for gaming. You guys have always heard plays best on AMD, plays best on Nvidia. That's because of subroutines and developers or like manufacturers like Nvidia and AMD will send out an engineer to go and help these game developers develop for a game they're dumping money in. So of course the best experience will be on Nvidia because if Nvidia card used this routine, if AMD used this routine, yes, it takes place. Now you're gonna have three of those. So that's just a way to make sure that you can even play your games or even get an image out of your graphics card uh, on particular software. So I don't think the discrete graphics card that we're seeing is what we're gonna actually be seeing when the retail card comes to market. So this leads me into the last part of my video. Is it worth waiting for? My answer is unless you're shopping for a graphics card the next three to five years, no, it's not. Because although you may have brought in some of the really top industry talent when it comes to GPU development, you can't be 30 odd years behind Nvidia and suddenly think your first card is gonna come out and be competitive. You, we also have no idea what their target demographic is. They've said it should support 1080p gaming. What does that mean? 1080p no settings turned on, 1080p high, 1080p high refresh rate. I mean, what? We don't know that. And if we have to go based upon the iGPU that they have now shown us that the discrete card is based upon without even a power connector tells me it's not gonna compete with anything above potentially a GTX 1060. No, I didn't say 1660, 1060. I don't expect it to even come close to that. In fact, if I had to make a guess in gaming performance based on what we're seeing today on the 100% improvement over theoretical iGPU that's out today, I would say it might compete with an RX 460, maybe. So I'm not expecting any great performance to come out of that. 
I'm expecting a first generation graphics card to come out to potentially be maybe around the $200 price point. That might give you, like I said, 1060 performance. But again, that's gonna be one of those things we just have to wait and see. So my recommendation to you guys, seeing this information is don't get excited. Don't wait, just, I mean, the stuff that's out now is plenty good. And unless you for some reason hate both AMD and Nvidia, well, you're kind of screwed anyway then. You, had to, you gotta spend your money somewhere. And Intel, I don't think is gonna be the savior we're expecting yet. They clearly have the money. They clearly have the R&D and they are a manufacturer mogul. So there's no doubt they're gonna be able to compete in time. So at the end of the day, what do we know about the XE DG1? Really nothing. We really don't know. Again, CES is a hype show. We'll probably learn more at Computex, and I still think the card we're seeing today is nothing more than an ultra basic show no cards prior to playing your hand to tip off AMD and Nvidia and what's coming, just enough to get developers ready for the architecture because it'll scale up from there. If you understand the architecture, you can scale it pretty easily, but if you just have to guess, then who knows? So I don't think the card that we saw at CES is anything indicative of what's actually gonna be coming to market. My best guess is you're not gonna see anything truly ready to compete until the end of this year, maybe even CES or Computex next year, 2021. All right, guys, thanks for watching. Of course, if anything changes or we get any more information that's not leaks, but is actually concrete from Intel themselves, then we'll update you guys on what we know because obviously buying decisions and information is what we kind of try and do around here. And I don't, I don't want to steer you guys the wrong way saying, oh, it'll, be, it'll be years before we see anything and then suddenly they've got a 2080 Ti killer coming out in six months, which isn't gonna happen. So anyway guys, thanks for watching and as always, we'll see you in the next one.